Thank you for in, inviting me to participate on this, well, I don't know what to call it. It's both a happy and a sad occasion. Um, I've decided to structure what I want to say as a sort of a hybrid. It's going to be partly a regular physics seminar, um, but it's going to be a, a very personalized one um, because Charlie had actually a very profound influence basically on my life, my whole scientific career, uh, as you'll see as we go along. And I'll talk about how various um, ideas that Charlie had and discussions I had with him influenced what I ended up doing. All right, so we'll start with a, a little history. I'm going to start my history uh, with Joe Weber, who was a faculty member here. Um, and Joe was the pioneer of gravitational wave experiments, the first person to really make a serious attempt to detect gravitational radiation coming to us from distant objects. And this is a picture of Joe in, in his lab. You can see the, um, this big aluminum bar uh, that was supposed to be resonant at about a kilohertz, which would be the frequency from gravitational waves coming from solar mass uh, type objects. Um, and in the late 1960s, Joe started reporting positive results. He was detecting signals. And um, they were very difficult to explain from a theoretical point of view, given what we knew then about, about the, the universe. In particular, the signals seemed to be coming from the center of the Milky Way galaxy, so relatively nearby on an astronomical scale. And if you just sort of added up, you know, you knew the energy that was being deposited in this detector. You knew how far away the source was, roughly the center of our galaxy. And so if you assume that this energy was just being radiated in all directions in space, and you added up how much energy that was, it was a huge amount. It was so big that it was already ruled out just from the observations of stars orbiting close to the galactic center, we knew if that much mass had been lost for a long enough time, those stars would have become unbound. So something was wrong. And Charlie got interested in this problem and uh, came up with several ideas that might explain this. So one of them was the idea of beaming. Instead of assuming that the radiation is going out isotropically, what if it's like synchrotron radiation that is produced in accelerators, right? When you have charges orbiting at speeds close to the speed of light in circular motion, the radiation comes out in narrow beams. It's a big industry today that's used for all kinds of studies of biological molecules and materials and things like that. So was this a possibility of having gravitational synchrotron radiation? And then another key idea was this idea of um, uh, super radiant scattering. So this was the, the idea that if you had a rotating black hole, so you remember now, early 1960s, the, the Kerr metric describing the gravitational field of a rotating black hole was only discovered in 1963. It was still very, very fresh physics. And these rotating black holes, uh, Penrose had shown that if you, uh, in a thought experiment, if you dropped a particle in, in a certain orbit close to the black hole, and then you arrange for it to split into two, where one, one particle goes into the black hole and one comes out, the one that comes out can bring out more energy than fell in from the original particle. And that energy comes from the rotational energy, the black hole slows down. And so Charlie came up with this idea or just independently, uh, uh, the same idea was put forward by Zoldovich in the Soviet Union. So this is in the days when there was not much scientific communication. Um, this idea that there would be a, a wave analog. You could have a, a, a wave, or maybe a gravitational wave, scatter off a black hole. Some of it would get absorbed and some of it would come out and you could get more energy out that way. So some combination of these ideas may be important to explain Weber's observations. And so here are a pair of papers. Um, the one, sorry, 
One, one by Charlie himself, uh, where um, he proposes this idea of the super radiant scattering. And then another one with Charlie, and you'll see a bunch of collaborators here um, on this idea of gravitational synchrotron radiation. So how would you calculate these things? Um, and this brings us to the subject of black hole perturbations, right? So perturbation just means a small change, right? So you can make a linear approximation to deviations from some equilibrium state. So imagine you have, in this case, um, a Schwarzschild black hole, a perfectly spherical static black hole sitting there, and you tweak it a little bit, okay? And it will do various things, give out some gravitational waves, settle down back to equilibrium. And the equations for this, uh, studying this phenomenon had already been worked out by uh, Reggie and Wheeler. Reggie was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study, went on to become a very uh, eminent particle physicist. I don't know if it's his experience with Wheeler that made him change direct, who knows? Uh, that was a nasty remark. Um, and then uh, Zerilli, who was also a student at, at Princeton, that come up with this very simple equation, which those of you who've had elementary quantum mechanics will recognize is just a barrier penetration equation, right, for the perturbation. So the key point is that because the Schwarzschild solution is for us around a spherically symmetrical black hole, mathematically, you can treat it very simply, right, again, by the techniques you learn in, in undergraduate e &M courses, separation of variables, right? Because it's spherically symmetric, you can separate out the angular dependence, the, the theta and the phi coordinates with spherical harmonics. Because it's static, you can separate out the time dependence, and you're left with a radial equation that you have to solve, okay? And it takes this form where the omega is the frequency of the perturbation, and the V is just some potential describing the gravitational field outside the black hole. Okay, and so the immediate question is, well, if we want to treat rotational black holes, Kerr black holes, to see if we can get this gravitational synchrotron radiation or super radiant scattering, we want to do the analogous perturbation treatment for rotating black holes. So this became a, a very uh, sort of topical problem uh, after these, especially around the time of, of these papers. And this is when I arrived as a graduate student in, in Kipp's group at Caltech. And uh, so I got there, I got there in the fall of 1970. So by the end of 1971, I was an official member of Kipp's group. And just to give you an idea of what it was like back then, my uh, sort of more senior graduate students, the ones ahead of me, included people like Jim Ipsa, Richard Price, Bernie Schutz, Cliff Will, Bill Press. So people in the field will recognize these names. These all become very eminent physicists. And for me, uh, this was a pretty intimidating you know, act to follow. So I was sort of trying to keep my head down a little bit. I don't have a picture right from when I arrived. This was a few years late, 1974. Uh, you recognize Kip in the back left. That's Bill Press. That's me in the middle. Doug Erdley on the right is Carl Caves, who later became phys famous for um, figuring out how to do what's called squeezing of light, which has become a very important uh, technique that's used, in, among other places, in the LIGO gravitational wave detector. And it's Don Page on the left, uh, Alan Lightman, second from the right in the front, who after a, a career in astrophysics became a very famous novelist. You may remember his book, Einstein's Dreams, and various other things. Um, all right, so I'm not going to get too technical, but just to um, give an idea of what was going on. Um, one of the, the reasons that um, this, is, this is sort of the early 1970s was a flowering of general relativity. 
Um, so one of the reasons was discoveries in astronomy, um, black hole candidates and, and quasars and all these kinds of things. Um, but one of the important uh, reasons also was the introduction of new mathematical methods. And one of these things was the Newman-Penrose formalism, NP. And uh, just so you can follow what I'm going to say a little bit, um, so the traditional way of describing an electromagnetic field in relativity is you put together the electric and magnetic fields, so three components for the vector E, three components for the vector B, into that FAB tensor. In the Newman-Penrose formalism, that's these three complex scalars, so each of them has got two degrees of freedom. Similarly, for the curvature of space-time, that C tensor, the Weyl tensor, uh, as 10 independent components, there are now five complex scalars. And just for a physical interpretation, this one psi 4 on the end here is roughly related to H, the gravitational wave strain. So that H is what LIGO actually measures, right? The change in the arm lengths, the fractional change in the arm length of the detector. So Richard Price was the one who introduced this formalism into Kipp's group. And he showed that you could derive this Reggie Wheeler equation um, by a new method using this Newman Penrose formalism. If you took this psi 2 quantity, the middle one, right, it's, two, it's a complex number, and its imaginary part satisfied the Reggie Wheeler equation. And so, uh, <coughs> Fackrell and Ipsa, so Ipsa was also one of the graduate students try to do something analogous for the Kerr metric. They tried the easier electromagnetic case. And so they looked at that middle quantity phi one. So the, the equations are all mixed up, right? Because you have e, and e fields producing B fields and B fields producing and so on. And so from a mathematical point of view, what you want to do is you want to sort of decouple the equations, get a single equation, and they got one for phi one. But when you try to separate the variables, that didn't work. Because a rotating black hole, uh, it has a, a symmetry, right, about the rotation axis, but there's no symmetry in, in the latitude angle, right? That, it's nothing, you know, they're different, different angles and it's different gravitational fields. So the, the radial variable and the angular variable didn't separate, you were left with a complicated partial differential equation. And this is, remember, the early days of computers, it was not going to be easy to solve that. Um, so around this time, uh, Bardeen came uh, on sabbatical uh, to Caltech, and he was working with Press. Press was a year ahead of me as, as a graduate student. And we were walking back, Bill and I were walking back one day from the cafeteria after lunch, and he said to me, you know, um, Bardeen has found equations, not just for the middle one, imagine, you know, psi 2, but for the psi 0 and the psi 4, decoupled equations for them in the Schwarzschild metric. Now, remember, the Schwarzschild metric is spherically symmetrical. You could separate the variables. And, you know, I was, I don't know, a little cocky or something. I said to him, well, if it works for Schwarzschild, it'll work for Kerr. And he said something unprintable to me in return. And uh, so I went to my office and I sat down. And in a few hours, uh, I got this decoupling. I got a single equation for psi zero and a single equation for psi four. And I you know, went into Bill's office. I said, look, you see, it works and so on. And, and Bill said to me, yeah, but now you've got to separate the variables. Right? So uh, I tried to separate the variables and it didn't work. <laughs> Um, so, uh, just to give you an idea of what my thoughts were about Charlie at that time, he was this mythical super genius somewhere in the East, because uh, the way that we, we knew about him was, first of all, from these papers that had sort of set the research direction for us, but also we had, uh, Kip was teaching the, uh, the relativity course out of the uh, Xerox draft of Mr. Thorne and Wheeler. Now, if you think the book is big in printed version, can you imagine what a Xerox would look like, right? Because a lot of it was also one-sided, as I remember, right? So, pretty big. 
Yes, well, yes. Um, and, you know, there, there are a lot of homework problems in this book, and some of them are very difficult when we knew those were KIPs. But there were some impossible problems, and we, so I don't know if this was true, we ascribed them all to, it must be Misner, right? Just, <laughs> Kip would never do this to us, right? Um, so I'm telling Kip about this work I'm doing on, on trying to uh, separate the variables for the curve perturbations. And Kip tells me, well, you know, Charlie is an expert on partial differential equations. You should go and see him. And the next thing I know, Kip sends me off to spend a month here, right? So I spent a month in a seedy motel on, I, I try to look for it on, on here. Now there's only fancy hotels on Baltimore uh, Avenue. Um, uh, by the way, this, um, this happened just a few months after uh, I got married, and um, my wife was not happy. In fact, she's still bitter about it, and this is 50 years ago. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I, I came here, and Charlie gave me several of his handwritten, you know, these notebooks with the beautiful handwritten stuff of all these notebooks on partial differential equations. And, and so I, I found, you know, he was very nice to me and, and very helpful and so on, and I went through all this stuff. And unfortunately, there was nothing in there that could help me. So I, I got nowhere. I returned home. I felt bad. You know, Kip had paid for me to spend a month in, even if it was a cheap motel, it was a month. Um, so I, I felt bad. Um, and it turns out it actually was not Charlie's fault that he couldn't help me. Um, you know, I was just a little slow on the, on the uptake. It turned out that um, if instead of using the equation for psi 4, I just did what you sometimes have to do in freshman calculus, you change variables, you just multiply it by another factor, uh, then you got separation. So I've written out what this looks like, so the psi 4, so, you know, you know it's just a sum, it's a linear equation, so you can superpose. Um, so there's the time dependence. You'll see that t coordinate, e to the minus i omega t. The phi is the longitude coordinate. Uh, the theta is the latitude coordinate. And there's the radial function r, right? So nicely separated. And now you could start checking. Uh, and, and by the way, the gra you can't do gravitational synchrotron radiation. It turns out there's no magic. You'd need to accelerate masses to close to the speed of light, and that just doesn't happen typically for large masses in, in astrophysics. Uh, and the superradiant scattering, yes, there is superradiant scattering, and Bill and I were able to calculate it uh, using these equations. And it turned out to be interesting, but it still didn't solve the Weber problem of, of uh, how, to, how to explain the signals. All right, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit, but still working with, with curve perturbations. And so now we're kind of fast forwarding um, to sort of modern times. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the exciting physics that can be done now that LIGO is actually detecting um, the signals from, in particular, two black holes in orbit around each other that lose energy because they're emitting gravitational waves, they spiral together and then smash together and you get a nice big, a big signal. And this is from well before uh, these things were actually detected. Kip has this nice picture where the, this process is divided into three regions. So you see there's an in-spiral, a merger, so the in-spiral the, 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 the black holes are relatively far apart. So now we can, we can calculate the signal because it's almost Newtonian physics. Right? So just by, again, doing a kind of perturbation theory, post-Newtonian expansion, you can predict that signal. So that's why it's called known. After the black holes merge, you have, it's going to settle down to a Kerr black hole. So the settling down as it gets close to equilibrium, is a perturbation of Kerr. So that is now known. We, know we have simple, relatively simple equations to describe that. But the merger part 
there's nothing, no simple mathematical treatment for that. You, the only thing you can do is put it on a big computer. And so this is the field of numerical relativity. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it except to mention, uh, as Ted already pointed out, that the formalism that's used to put the equations, Einstein's equations, on the computer makes heavy use of this ADM, Arnaudesa Misner, decomposition of the equations into space and time, right? Because the computer needs to be able to, you know, you give it some initial condition describing two black holes in orbit, and then you have the stupid computer take little time steps going forward in time, calculating what the signal will be. Okay. So one of the um, early discoveries that was made uh, by, it's in this paper by uh, Charlie's student, uh, Vishu, Vishwashwara, who uh, was uh, um, Charlie's student, and independently there was another paper at the same time, was uh, in this ring down part where the merged black hole is settling down to equilibrium, the gravitational wave signal has imprinted in it some properties of that black hole, that final black hole it's settling down to. And you can think of it as, um, you know, imagine you have a violin string or some, you know, some string that you can pluck, right? So we know it vibrates and there's a particular tone that you can get depending on how you you know, the length of the string where you put your finger and things like that. And so, so these things are called the normal modes of vibration, right? So each one has a distinct frequency. Now, it, the, for black holes, it turns out that these, when the black hole is settling down, it has these normal modes. It's just like hitting a bell, right? You hear the, the note of the bell, but then the energy it gets carried off in sound waves and the bell settles down back to equilibrium. And you can hear that in the decay of the tone, right? It's not a pure pitch. There's a dying off thing to it. And for black holes, the dying off is very strong, right? It's just a few cycles. You don't get a nice long note. So the decay time is comparable to the frequency. And so uh, Bill Press, in a paper, the year after this, coined this for name a quasi-normal mode. It's not, we reserve normal modes for something that you can really hear the note for a long time. Something that decays so quickly, it's not really a note, so it's a quasi-normal mode. And this was noticed by, by Vishwashwara using some com computer calculations from Schwarzschild. So now again, jumping forward, when you do this for the rotating black holes, the, the form of the uh, gravitational wave signal at late times is a superposition of these modes. So here's the gravitational wave strain, H. All right, so it's some complex coefficient, the C. There's the omega with, you'll see, I'll explain these subscripts L, M, and N in a second and T minus R, so this is just some outgoing wave. And then there's the angular dependence, which if it was a Schwarzschild black hole would be an ordinary YLM, that's the notation we use for spherical things. So I'm not gonna distinguish, I'll just, we'll think of them as modes. So the L and the M label which mode, what, what the angular shape of the modes is. Is it a dipole, quadrupole, things like that. And then the N, is the overtone number. If you think from quantum mechanics, like the radial quantum number from, that, that you get from that. So let's focus on a particular mode. We'll select an L and an M. And in particular for LIGO, the most important is the 2-2 mode, right? So it's really a very restricted case. And so the prediction is there should be a superposition over the ends, right? The, the various uh, and the name we give to this is the overtones, right? So n equal to zero is the fundamental mode, and then n equal to one, two, three are called the overtones. Now, actually, that was a mistake. 
Don't blame me, I didn't call them overtones, okay? Um, because when, when a physicist hears the word, or a musician hears the word overtones, they think of harmonics, right? Something which is a multiple of the fundamental frequency. These overtones are not multiples of the fundamental frequency. They're just a label that's given to the least damped mode is n equal to zero, the second least is n equal to one, and so on. But, you know, it's too late. We're stuck with the word overtone. Now, there is a theorem in general relativity, the no hair theorem, um, which says that the final state, the final equilibrium black hole, is a very simple object. It has to be this Kerr metric. It's only described by two quantities, the mass of the black hole and the spin or the angular momentum. In theory, it can have a charge, but that's not important for astrophysics. Um, Wheeler was the one who gave it the no-hair name because uh, Wheeler was completely bald, and I think this is an early expression of bald pride. Um, okay, so um, one problem with the name overtone is you usually ignore them, right? They're, they're subdominant, not important, right? It's only if you really, you know, a professional musician. Right? Now, in the uh, 2007, so the first successful numerical calculations of black hole mergers was done in 2005. So this is the Stone Age as far as computer simulations of black holes are concerned. They noticed that if you had the in-spiral of two black holes, you saw the, over saw the fundamental, 2-2, two, two, so with a zero, and they saw three overtones, and that this simple picture could describe the, you know, there's a sort of a peak of the waveform, and then everything after that seemed to be described by this simple picture. And what's wrong with that is that surely the strongest part of the waveform should correspond to the actual merger of these two black holes. The most violent part, you're not even close to equilibrium, right? So in physical terms, the most nonlinear part of this whole phenomenon. And yet there's a description where a large part of the signal is a linear superposition of these simple modes. So obviously that's not physics, must be an accident, right? Um, and there's a, a, a waveform model that's being used in the data analysis for LIGO called EOB, effective one body model. And so uh, in particular, Alessandra was the person who uh, really worked a lot of this out. The, the ring down was modeled by including some quasi normal modes to describe the ring down part and then figuring out how to blend that into the in spiral part. And it's not Alessandra's fault, but the community seemed to develop this uh, concept, this picture, that the quasi normal modes were good for the modeling of the early part of the ring down, but of course this wasn't physical. So it does raise the question, though, at what point do quasi-normal modes actually describe the physics in, uh, in, and give a correct description? And uh, my student, Matt Giesler, um, showed quite recently that, in fact, this picture seems to be very good. That, in fact, a, a linear superposition of quasi-normal modes does describe the early part of the waveform accurately. And here's the, some evidence. So what's plotted here, this M is a mismatch. So that's, a, that's telling you how, um, how bad the model is. <laughs> so we make a superposition of normal modes. We start with N equal to zero, the fundamental. And that's the blue curve. And you see if you wait, so zero is the peak of the waveform. At late times, you can, you can see that this, the, the, this simple picture that one mode describes this particular uh, waveform to a, a precision of about 10 to the minus 5. Now as you add more and more overtones, you can see even at the early times at t equal to 0, below 10 to the minus 6. 
Okay, so this is now, this is not data from LIGO, this is a very accurate numerical calculation from the full Einstein equations. So this is mysterious, right? Why, why should this be true? So another way of saying is the nonlinearities are small despite our preconceptions. And one way to think about it is, so this is not data, this is just an, an illustration, take the amplitudes of the modes that Matt found in the, you know, that give this description. So that tells you how high to draw these curves at t equal to zero. And now these modes are decaying exponentially, which on this plot is a straight line. So you can see the fundamental is the blue one. And you see you have to wait before that one is dominant. At early times, these so-called overtones are actually the, the biggest part of the signal. The only thing is they decay away more rapidly than the overtone. So that's the new picture, or at least the picture we're, we're proposing. And there was other evidence for, you know, if you made small perturbations and so on, didn't change things. And this, of course, was a quite a controversial result. There are some back and forth with papers claiming this is not correct and so on and so on. I, I'm not going to get into that. People can ask me questions if, if they like. Uh, I just want to say one thing why this is not an easy subject. So this, this is addressed to people who might want to work in this. How do you fit exponentials, right? So you have some model, some exponentials, and you want to fit it to data, whether it's real LIGO data or numerical uh, waveforms to do accurate calculations. So the first thing is the omega here is complex. It's a com you know it's got a frequency and a damping time built in, but there's an amplitude and a phase. You do not go to Python and find their nonlinear least squares package. Okay. First of all, if you know the frequencies, this is a linear least squares problem. Okay. So that's that's a trivial problem these days. Provided you know which modes, how many modes are actually the right number to be fitting for. But if you know that, you can do this. If you don't know the, the omegas, the frequencies and damping times, now it is a nonlinear least squares problem. Again, don't use Python, okay? Or don't use the standard one in the library. This is known to be ill-conditioned, all right? It's been known at least since 1956, that's the earliest reference I could find. Okay, this came up when people were fitting for uh, a radioactive decay of isotopes. It's important in, uh, if you ever have an MRI on your brain, um, your brain has membranes, and the modeling of that includes fitting those e to the i omega t's, and you need special procedures for doing that. The best algorithm that's known is called VARPRO, and, but it's been known since 1973, right? So, um, and to give you an idea, this is now just an analytic model. You can go home and do this on your iPhone or something, right? On your laptop, right? So make yourself a linear superposition of exponentials. So I've chosen, this is the same graph that we did there. And you do the fitting, assume the frequency is unknown, and so now there is actually error in here. It's at the level of 10 to the minus 16. But using Python's linear least squares thing, you can recover these. So what's done here is I've chosen in steps of, of one unit, I've just moved the start time later and later. The fitting time is way out here. The end of the fitting is at 80 or something. All right, but you can recover nice straight lines for the amplitudes. Now add some noise. So I added noise at the level of 10 to the minus 5. And now you see that between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the minus 3 or so, you start losing your ability to recover those fits. So 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 2, three orders of magnitude. And that's what we mean by ill conditioning. You make a small perturbation, but you get a large effect. And it's even worse. In the nonlinear case, now pretend we don't know the frequencies. We're using VARPRO, the best known routine. 
And we're going to make it even simpler. We'll fit for one mode at a time. So here's the frequencies, real and imaginary frequencies. And you see, with perfect data, 10 to the minus 16 machine errors, you can recover. So what's actually being done there is for each of those fits, right? You, you always home in on, on the correct answer. Now you put in 10 to the minus 5 noise, you can recover the, the fundamental, the first overtone, maybe the second one, but then things wander all over the complex plane. Okay? So if you want to tackle this problem, if you want to ask, is it really true that this is a linear description, you have to do something more sophisticated. Okay? So I'm not going to get into that, uh, but this is an active area of research. And if you trace back, where does this all start, right? So this is stuff I'm working on now. You can see there's a clear path that goes all the way back to the, uh, my interactions with Charlie and some of the things that, that I learned at that time. Um, so I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions. Okay. Good. We do have some time to um, ask questions or discuss. Or, okay, I see a hand in the back. Hi. So uh, while talking about the uh, experiment which uh, Weber conducted, you mentioned that he was trying to attribute the energy uh, deposited to one single source in the center of the Milky Way. Yeah. So is there any reason he did that, like not consider multiple sources? Yes. Yeah, he, he, he noticed that the, um, the event, so this was a resonant bar, right? So he would, you know, there would be a signal uh, that would show up, you know, at a discrete time. And when he plotted the events as a function of time, um, he noticed there was a correlation with the position of the center of our galaxy, right, as the Earth rotates, right? So there was sort of a, 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 an increase in the event rate okay. that he was reporting. Uh, I guess and my so, second question would be, do we have a better insight on the problem right now? But... Oh, I think the, the, the experiment was not correct. Okay. Yeah, so it was, a, it was not, the events he was seeing were not because of gravitational waves, right? Other people, um, built their own bars and tried to re reproduce the experiment and, and were not able to succeed. Okay, thank you. Next hand. Let's see here. Over there, okay. Where we... Was that? Ted. Yeah. Ted, okay, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I have two questions. One is, um, I wonder when you went to see Charlie, were you aware of, or did he mention the existence of the Carter constant for um, simplifying the trajectories of a particle yeah, orbiting yeah. So that, curve? That's why everybody thought there was a possibility of uh, separating the equations, because we knew the work of Carter. Yeah. And so that's what motivated. So Carter had shown how to uh, separate variables for the equations of uh, particle motion and uh, an artificial scalar type of radiation, which is a simplified mathematical description, but didn't describe real gravitational waves. So because of Carter's work, that's why there was all these uh, attempts to okay. find. And now I follow up on that. You said that um, it worked out for you when you multiplied by a factor. Yes. Did you just fiddle with it until that just popped out that it worked, or did you have a reason to think that you should use that particular integrating? No, factor? so what it, it actually took. So what happened was I'd spent a lot of time trying different transformations, and and nothing worked. And meanwhile, Kip had given me uh, my official thesis problem, which I was supposed to be working on. So this was something that was like spurred by this conversation with Bill Press and the work of Bardeen. So I, I sort of would put the, that work aside and go work on my official thesis problem. And then I would take, you know, go back and try something else. So this took about six months of trial and, you know, before, don't ask me why. why. And how did you I never, feel? By the way, I never did solve Kip's 
a thesis problem. I don't know why you let me graduate. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it's not too late to revoke your degree. <laughs> but uh, I, a personal question about how did you feel when it finally worked and it separated? Do you remember the feeling? Uh, well, it's one of those things that we all hope to have. It's a feeling of elation, right? Because for a little while, you're the only person who knows something about the universe. <laughs> um, and another follow. But it you, happens very seldom, I'll tell you. Do we now know why that particular funny integrating factor was the right one to use? Like, could now do we know enough that we could have yeah, anticipated yeah. it? Well, in well, no, it's worse than that, right? Because um, the reason I was looking at that Psi 4 was that's the one that, that describes outgoing gravitational waves. That's what we're physically interested in. There was also this equation for Psi 0, right? the other extreme one. That describes gravitational waves that are coming into a system. Well, who, that's not it. You know, why would you look at that? If I had looked at that equation, that one separates without any funny factors. I would have saved myself six months of work. <laughs> so, so it's just related to a choice of the of the uh, coordinates of the you know how you choose the tetrad in the, the Newman Penrose thing, and by choosing the tetrad in the way that was standard um, at that time, it made the the one equation more complicated and the other one less. So there's a symmetric form where you can put factors in front of both of them. It's purely, it's all just arbitrary. So it somehow comes from the normalization of the tetrad. Yeah. If you started out today trying to solve it, knowing everything we know about the formalism, you probably would have gotten straight to the answer. No, I don't think so. So they still That's require a... some inspiration and yeah, fiddling. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Oh, yes. Okay. We're seeing in the chat um, the uh, Ray, Ray Ted talk. My bookshelf shows gravitation and introduction to current research edited by Lewis Whitten contained Arno Whitten. Um, we have a couple hands back here. Let's see. I don't know who was first, though. I, I saw the first. Was there a hand here? Okay. Hi. So um, for the one month that you spent uh, with Misner, um, I just wanted to ask, what, um, what different methods did you learn from him that would have helped you in, uh, in that whole like separation of variables? Um, and in the in the following six months, did he use any of those, or were they helpful in directing you to the right answer, or was it just kind of a dead end? Uh, quite honestly, it was not helpful for this problem. I mean, I learned a lot about. Okay, is there another one more? Just curious, what was the thesis problem Professor Thorne gave you? <laughs> uh, it was to figure out what happens to the horizon of a black hole when it's perturbed. So how does it respond to the perturbations? And, and in fact, this problem was only solved like you know, 30 years after that. Um, and, and it's still not quite, you know, it was, turned out to be a hard problem. <laughs> All right, uh, I see one more hand, okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, is there any sort of like physical significance to like the impedance of a medium to be able to scatter or transmit gravitational waves and how would you like characterize that? Um, so yeah, the, I mean, it's possible to, to use that kind, those kinds of concepts for that. Personally, I've not found it useful, I mean, I. To me, uh, I like to just think of having an effective potential uh, outside the black hole, and then you send the waves in, and you know, depending on the frequency or the energy that the wave has, um, you know, it can it can tunnel through the barrier, or it can go over the top and get captured, um, and then some is reflected, and that's the scatter 
scattering picture, right? That's how I think of it. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yes, one more. Hi. Um, what was the reason of trying to uh, study the Inspire using um, the combination of QNMs? Uh, was that before uh, PN expansion and EOB theory? Is it preferable? Is there less computational time? No, no. so the QNMs are only useful for the ring down, yeah. For the ring down. So in the ring down, the, the post Newtonian theory is not useful because it's not close new, to Newtonian gravity. You have a black hole. Yes, I know that. I right. just thought you said that the Inspiral can be approximated by the post Newtonian um, part, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 you said that it can also be approximated by the overlapping of QNMs. No, so no. So the idea is you want to you want to make a model for LIGO data analysis. So you need all parts, all three parts. You need the Inspiral, the merger, and the ring down, and so you have to make a model that combines those. This idea of using something for the quasi, you know, for the ring down. And then you have a different model for the in spiral, and then you have to make them join somehow. Yeah, I know that's what phenomenological models do usually. Yes, well, that's that's why people I think had this idea that the quasi-normal modes near the peak was phenomenological and not physical. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, let's thank Saul again. <laughs>